Well, I'd like officially to say welcome to this webinar, Digging Deeper into the Bosnian Pyramids. We are so happy that so many of you would like to join us now live. And um, also welcome to the ones who are watching later on in the video that we will be uh, posting out later. And for this webinar, you, you see the three of us here who are hosting it. It's um, Rich Hoyle, who is the field geologist of the Bosnian Pyramid of the Sun Foundation. So he really has um, a finger on the pulse of what's going on in Bosnia uh, right now. And he has been working there for many years now and knows like he's one of the people who knows most about these pyramids. So it's really awesome that we can do this together. And then we also have the Rie, who has written a book about the pyramids uh, in Danish. Um, and myself, and my name is Julie Mariel, and I'm an anthropologist and working with the, the, within the field of spirituality. And Rie and I are having um, hosting travels to Bosnia with our co-joint project um, Portal Journeys. And uh, to just give you a brief introduction to um, how the three of us got involved with this whole pyramid project, um, we'll make a short round of uh, introducing ourselves and uh, shortly just telling you uh, how we ended up uh, in Visico. So Richard, would you like to start? Sure, yeah. So uh, thanks for the introduction, uh, Julie, and welcome to everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, so I was a student at Leeds University studying hydrocarbon geology and um, you know my father was also in the industry so I felt like I needed to follow in his footsteps. Unfortunately he wasn't really catching my um, you know full attention. Um, there was there was something lacking. I didn't really like the, uh, the destruction of the environment that the industry is responsible of and uh, I was reading some alternative uh, theories to pyramids while I was studying uh, sedimentology. Obviously, the pyramids in Giza are built out of limestone. And I was reading, for example, Graham Hancock's um, books, um, Both Architect for the Universe by uh, Ralph Ellis. That was one that initially caught my attention. And um, I took myself on a trip, um, a research trip to G the Giza Plateau, just to see how these uh, alternative theories, if they matched up to reality, because uh, if they did, it would change a lot of things from my perception of history. And uh, on my return back from that trip, I was just Googling some things uh, regarding what I was looking for. And uh, I saw a picture of the Bosnian Pyramid of the Sun randomly pop up on Google Images. And immediately looking at this picture, I was like, well, that, that's a pyramid. You know, what's all the fuss about? And I found uh, the email address to Dr. Sam, who was this gentleman, um, beginning this research and uh, I wrote him a really really long email lots of questions you know I think it took about two hours formulating this email trying to make myself sound smarter than I actually am and um, he actually replied within about 30 minutes which was really good of him because I'm sure he gets a lot of emails from everyone asking similar questions uh, but his email was simply probably easier if you come here uh, and I couldn't really argue with that. So uh, in the summer, between years of study at university, I took myself uh, to Visico, uh, central Bosnia. And uh, that was the first volunteer shift ever in 2010. And basically, that's where it started for me. Yeah, great. great. Thank you. And um, yeah, maybe I should uh, tell my story now because... Uh, Ria's story and mine are intertwined, as you can probably tell, because Ria and I are sisters. Um, and for me, getting involved with the, the pyramids started with um, a friend of mine in high school who is originally from Bosnia, um, who came to live in Denmark in the beginning of the 90s because of the war. And she asked Ria and I if we wanted to come with her to Sarajevo for a summer holiday to spend some time there in her family's apartment and uh, look around. And we were eager to do that, uh, not knowing that there were something this exciting in Bosnia. But then she um, showed us, maybe to get us a little more hooked on the idea of going, uh, she showed us some footage of uh, the tunnels and the, 
the pyramids and we were super excited and we're just uh, thrilled to be able to go there. So we went there um, on holiday and went out for just a single day to see the pyramids. And we were so lucky that on that exact tour in the tunnels, we were able to join Dr. Sam's um, tour. And um, so he showed us around and afterwards we purchased uh, a book of his and we got to talk with him a little bit and he found out that we were anthropologists and he um, got us in touch with uh, Ricardo, the, the archaeologist at that time. And um, he almost put us to work uh, straight there on the spot uh, because he assumed that we might be volunteers, which is possible there. Um, but that got us hooked on the idea that we could become volunteers. So we went back in 2013, the year after, and uh, joined uh, as volunteers there for two weeks. And there we met Richard and became good friends with him. And um, the following year, uh, I went back again as a volunteer for yet another shift. And uh, Ria, your story is a little different from here on. Yeah, I think this is where I should uh, butt in because um, yeah, after having visited first as a tourist and then the next year as a volunteer, I was so fortunate that I got offered a position as a um, research assistant uh, in 2014. It was the year when Tim Moon was, um, was in charge of the excavations. So I was helping out there with the research and also with supervising excavations and coordinating the volunteers. Um, and that was a really, really exciting experience. Um, and after that, I came back and I, I did a training as shaman, modern day shaman, like Julie did. We're both working with shamanism and we're anthropologists. And as the latest thing, I wrote a book about the pyramids. So I got to really uh, look into every detail. I, I knew a lot about it before, but to write this, I had to really study into everything that's been written. So that's uh, also been a, a very interesting journey down the rabbit hole. Um, and Julie and I are, uh, are guiding tours to the pyramids now. So we had our first tour in the summer 2019 and we were supposed to go there twice this year but as you know that couldn't happen so we hope we'll be back this year yeah thank you Rie. and now let's get to talk about these pyramids um, we assume that some of the people watching tonight um, already know something about the pyramids but there might also be some who uh, are new to this topic so to start off, it would be nice to just, if um, maybe Richard, you could give just a tiny uh, tour of what are the Bosnian pyramids. And then it would be lovely to hear from both you, Richard, first, and then Ria afterwards. What are your very best arguments that these are actually man-made pyramids? Okay. So a brief introduction, um, 2005 was when the uh, Bosnian py pyramids, uh, the phenomena was first announced um, across the world's media uh, by a gentleman, as we mentioned, Dr. Sam Osmanagic, he's the discoverer of the Bosnian pyramids. And from that time, 2005, um, beginning in 2006, excavations and scientific research has been ongoing. So we're now at what, 15, 16 year of those investigations. Now, uh, the locations principally that, are under, that have been under investigation is uh, the Bosnian Pyramid of the Sun, formerly known as Vistocica Hill. We also have uh, Bosnian Pyramid of the Moon and um, uh, Tumuli, Tumulus, I should say, which is similar to Silbury Hill in Wiltshire, UK, almost exactly the same uh, height dimensions. Uh, it has one of the largest megalithic blocks uh, discovered in Europe. Um, and also, most importantly, and where most of the activities taking place right up till today are the Ravna tunnels. Now, this is an underground network of tunnels, which uh, at present we are about two and a half kilometers away from the Bosnian Pyramid of the Sun. And when these tunnels were first found, they'd actually been backfilled. So um, in the time since their first discovery, the Bosnian Pyramid of the Sun Foundation has been focused on removing the loose rubble material, which is blocking access 
into this tunnel network. Now, I might add uh, just the dimensions of the pyramid. So principally in the centre of the Bosnian Pyramid Valley, we have three major pyramids, the Bosnian Pyramid of the Sun, Bosnian Pyramid of the Moon, and the Bosnian Pyramid of the Dragon. And um, I guess one of the reasons why uh, the Bosnian Pyramids are so contentious is because of the sheer scale of the sites. The Bosnian Pyramid of the Sun is approximately 300 metres tall. Um, we haven't pinned down the exact foundations of the structure yet. A Bosnian Pyramid of the Moon, which is the second tallest, is 190 metres tall. So that one's 50 metres taller than the Great Pyramid of Giza. Bosnian Pyramid of the Dragon is uh, a little bit smaller. That's only 70 metres tall, but it's still absolutely huge compared to most pyramids known around the world. Um, Bosnian Pyramid of the Sun, the sheer scale of it, it's been estimated by structural engineers in terms of mass to be 33 times more massive than the Great Pyramid of Giza. So this is uh, very hard for um, people to get their heads around because obviously until 2005, no one at all had heard of um, pyramids in Bosnia. Yeah, and also these pyramids are covered in vegetation. So therefore it has been said that these pyramids are just mountains and it has been, that's the reason they have been laying there undiscovered for so long because they blend into the landscape. So Richard, how can you say that it's not just mountains? So you're asking for some of the proofs. Okay. so. First of all, being covered in vegetation, uh, there are still many, many, many pyramids. I mean, we don't actually know how many pyramids that are still buried in the Amazonian uh, rainforest, for example. Uh, the pyramids outside of Mexico City, when they were discovered in the 19th century, they were covered in soil and trees. So to, <clears throat> to, to find pyramids in Bosnia to be covered, that's to be expected if we look at the vast majority of pyramids that have yet to be excavated around the world. Um, so one of, them, one of the key sort of points to these being not normal hills, for example, is their orientation. So first of all, the Bosnian pyramid of Sun, Moon and Dragon all have four sides and they're oriented towards the cardinal points, North, South, East and West, very accurately. Um, so that's one tell. You can look at the pyramids in Giza, for example, on the, the Giza Plateau, the Great Pyramid. That's oriented north, south, east, west. Some of the pyramids around the world aren't. I'll give you that. For example, some might be offset at uh, significant numbers like 12 degrees, 30 degrees, 60 degrees. Um, but here we see, just like uh, in Egypt, north, south, east, west. Now, some people will argue, for example, that well, there are pyramidal shaped mountains all around the world. Uh, take, for example, the Matterhorn um, in the Alps. That's got pyramidal faces and that is also closely oriented north, south, east, west. You also have the sacred mountain Kalash in the Himalayas. Triangular faces north, south, east, west. In the UK, we have a pyramidal shaped uh, mountain called Great Gable in the Lake District. That's got triangular faces and it's approximately oriented north, south, east, west. So why is it any different if these are hills? Why aren't we calling uh, the Bosnian pyramids just hills? Well, all of those examples that I've just previously listed are isolated, standalone, triangular mountains. There's just one with that form. When we look at the Bosnian Pyramid Valley, for example, we have the Bosnian Pyramid of Sun, Moon and Dragon, not only all three of them oriented north, south, east, west, approximately 2.2 kilometres peak to peak from each other, but they form a near perfect equilateral triangle with internal angles of 60 degrees. And this figure of the equilateral triangle isn't just uh, occurring here in the Bosnian Pyramid Valley. We actually see it in several other um, pyramid complexes around the world. Uh, the Giza Plateau, for example, two of the pyramids form an apex of an equilateral triangle and the surveying point that was used for the construction of the pyramid site uh, forms the equilateral triangle at Giza. We also have uh, in South America, for example, there is another pyramid site, Tiwanaku, that also forms a near perfect equilateral triangle. And of course, the figure of an equilateral triangle is uh, an ancient sacred uh, symbol in itself. So 
there is a very significant reason why we see the three pyramids in Bosnia forming that equilateral triangle between our peoples. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Rie, maybe you'd like to add some of your favorite arguments that it's actually man-made structures. Yes. Well, first of all, we can look at the concrete that the Bosnian Pyramid of the Sun is made out of. It's concrete blocks that are neatly layered on top of each other. They're rectangular with right angled corners. Um, so when you look at that, it, to me, that's a smoking gun. And the concrete, at first, if you're not trained, it can look quite natural because it's been made in a way that is similar to how <laughs> nature works but it it's uh, distinct from natural concrete in the sense that it's re these rectangular blocks and that they are forming this perfect pyramid um, but the concrete has been tested and found to be artificial yeah and let, let me just interject for a second there Rhi, sorry but um <clears throat> yeah this is this is one issue that we do face so if we do have some geologists and we don't have that many, to be perfectly honest. But when we do get some geologists come to actually conduct some field investigations in the Bosnian Pyramid Valley, they look at the, uh, the material on the north face of the Bosnian Pyramid of the Sun that's been exposed. And, uh, you know, they say, well, it looks, it just looks like natural stone. So obviously it's natural stone, therefore it's all natural and uh, nothing to see here. <clears throat> Again, without taking into account the other aspects, for example, the orientation, the alignments, so on and so forth, plus the myriad of other proofs that we have, which we can go into in a little while. But uh, let's just talk about geopolymer technology, which is fairly recent in modern times. And this is a means through using uh, natural sedimentary materials and chemical reactants, we can actually produce uh, a man-made stone that will appear like a natural stone and where nature would take thousands of, or maybe millions of years to produce a sandstone from say loose sand that you would find on a beach. Through chemical reactions, we can uh, create that same material uh, in a matter of hours, maybe two days at the most, depending on if you're using exothermic or endothermic uh, reactions. But it can cure within a couple of hours. Uh, and actually, if you expose those geopolymers to uh, the natural elements, cold, wind, rain, you will actually find that the surface weathers to look almost um, you know, exactly the same as a natural stone would. So if you consider the age of the pyramids, which again, we will go into in a little while, um, it's no wonder then that a geologist would look at this material and then just say, well, it just looks like natural stone. But if we're talking about a geopolymer technology, which by the way, isn't uh, unheard of, Joseph Davidovitz is saying the same thing about the Giza blocks um, on the Great Pyramid of Giza being a geopolymerized material, then it's, it's not really difficult to uh, understand why a geologist would say it just looks like a natural stone because geopolymers are supposed to look like natural stone. Good point. Yes, thank you. And it's uh, it's great that we can supplement each other like this. So don't be shy to interrupt me. <laughs> it's so good to have your geological perspective on it. And that's one of the things that I really enjoy about uh, this archaeological project, that it's open to also look at it from other angles, to have, for example, you as a geologist working with it. That adds a lot, because if you look at an archaeological site only through archaeological perspective, it will give you fewer answers than if you add people such as geologists to, to have that perspective. Well, let me, let me just uh, interrupt you again. Actually, something that happened yesterday um, on uh, a web portal in Bosnia, an article had just been uh, published. And I think it was written by, or at least it had comments by a historian, professor, Bosnian, I do believe. Um, and recently he's just completely criticized the project in this article that came out yesterday as a historian and you know as a historian your sources of information have to come from you know written books texts records so 
from a historian's point of view, if they don't have historical texts or records, then in their mind, I suppose it doesn't exist. So when we're talking about prehistoric um, material structures, there is going to be no historic record if they've not been previously recognised. And um, this, this professor was quite insulting towards the efforts that the Bosnian Pyramid of the Sun Foundation have been conducting, uh, spreading rumours and such, um, we, which we can go into uh, in a little bit. But right now he's, he's bringing up the, um, the old argument that the foundation is damaging the legitimate archaeology. And he's talking about the medieval fort on top of the Bosnian Pyramid of the Sun. And, and his arguments that all we're doing is destroying things is, is complete nonsense because we've never even touched the top near that fort. And actually in the 10 years that I've been working here, I've seen how uh, archeologists are reconstructing this medieval fort. And they've made a, a pig's ear of it really. They, they've completely destroyed the remaining foundations of that fort themselves. Um, so yeah, we're dealing with a lot of um, disinformation about what's happening to take attention away from the evidence that actually the Bosnian Pyramid of the Sun Foundation has accrued since 2005. Um, again, this historian, he's not so mentioned anything about the LIDAR survey that was conducted in 2012. He's not mentioned anything about the seismic surveys that were conducted um, by Russian institutes of science, uh, I think it's I will bring that up in a second, but we had two geophysicists from Russia, from the Academy of Sciences, uh, conduct uh, seismic surveys of the Bosnian Pyramid of the Sun. Did the historian mention that their conclusions uh, suggested that the internal structure matched that of the Great Pyramid of Giza? No, he didn't, because he's an historian, he's not a geophysicist, and he's not willing to look outside of his sort of narrow section of expertise and like you say this is uh, a multi-dimensional project uh, where we have multidisciplinary i should say where we have all kinds of people coming together bringing their expertise so we have engineers physicists biologists doctors medical doctors we have uh, geographers geologists etc etc coming here adding their little piece uh, to the puzzle yes um, and I think we will go into the chronology um, after this because uh, that would help uh, understand why also it is so hard to believe for people uh, who are new to this idea of the Bosnian pyramids. Um, but before we move on, I would like to just say if uh, you who are watching uh, have some questions popping up along as, as we go, um, if you don't understand what's uh, being said and you have some uh, questions into these things, please write them in the chat in the right hand side. And in the end of the webinar, we will uh, spend some time answering uh, all questions, all kinds of questions. So uh, if you need, if you have questions for clarification, come with them as we go along. And otherwise you can ask uh, the rest of the questions in the end. Um, and uh, Ria, did you get to finish on uh, your proofs? Or were you about to mention a last thing? Uh, well, one more smoking gun, I think, is the dry walls inside the tunnels. They're really important because some have claimed that the tunnels are uh, natural tunnels or that the foundation is digging them themselves or that it's old mining tunnels. But all of these uh, theories can be rejected because we keep on, as we excavate or as they excavate <laughs> the tunnels, they keep on finding new drywalls. So that means uh, that the tunnels have been there. It's not the, the foundation digging them themselves because there are drywalls coming all the time. Um, and also just to, to wipe off the, the mining theory, there's nothing to mine for and there are no traces of mining, no uh, chemicals no minerals left that should have been there um so the dry walls are really important as well yeah i mean yeah the arguments that we we hear is that it's an old mine and this comes from the fact that in a nearby town there was in fact a gold mine and there's actually a local history book 
that writes about uh, there being some sort of suggestion of a mine in the Ravna Tunnels area. But this the history book was written in the 1980s and it literally is two lines saying, and there's a mine in this area. No evidence, uh, no, no references as to how he's come to this, the, the author's come to this conclusion. And when we look <clears throat> at Ravna Tunnels, and we say, okay, let's let's see, how is it a mine? Well, from a geological perspective, to first of all classify anything as a mine, you need to have minerals of economic importance. Okay, so whatever that be, coal, gold, silver, aluminium, whatever you're mining, it needs to have some monetary value to make it worthwhile to put that effort in to mine it. Now that's the first thing. Now let's play devil's advocate advocate for a second and let's just say that the Ravna tunnels is full of gold okay because there's a gold mine um, in the next town along so let's say Ravna tunnels is a gold mine the way that these people would be mining that gold if we look at how the tunnels have been created through that uh, conglomerate deposit it's the most terrible mining exercise anyone's mm -hmm. ever seen it's a near surface deposit so if you were going to mine it, and of course, again, we're talking about economic importance. So we've got to look at the amount of energy that you're putting into extracting that mineral. You're going to want to make it as efficient as possible to make as much money as possible. Digging these, you know, really intricate tunnels in all kinds of directions, sometimes random directions, sometimes intersecting each other. That's the most inefficient method of mining this kind of deposit. It would be almost certainly an open cast mine because it's near surface you would just dig from the side and just systematically move forward through the through the deposit you wouldn't need to be digging these random tunnels if you were following for example a vein a mineral vein then maybe you would be digging these tunnels through the deposit however the kind of rock that we're looking at has no mineral veins because it's just a loosely consolidated near surface conglomerate that's fairly young geologically speaking so all these people that are saying, oh, it's just a mine, I guarantee you not a single one of these people has any knowledge of geology or mining. I'll just put it there. Yeah. So but it's been very contested uh, still uh, about these pyramids, whether it can actually be true, because it's also so unbelievable how old they actually are. Uh, and that uh, goes against uh, many theories about uh, when civilization was evolved enough to create structures like this. So uh, would one of you like to take, take us through the chronology of uh, the building of these pyramids and the tunnels? So we have various uh, dates to work with. We, we haven't actually pinpointed the exact age of uh, the construction of the pyramid. But we do have some limits, let's say, for example. And just to add, when I was at school, the oldest civilization was 6,000 years old, Sumeria. At a push now, they're saying maybe 8,000 years old. But since uh, the water damage on the Sphinx, for example, on the Giza Plateau, or other discoveries such as Gobekli Tepe in, uh, in south of Turkey, we're seeing that the age of advanced, let's say, stone megalithic cultures uh, is much older than 6,000 years, which, you know, that was being professed um, 20 years ago. So every year we're pushing back that age. So the ages that we're actually working with now in Bosnia, if we look at the trend, at how these ages are getting older and older, what we're working with won't actually seem so out of context eventually mm -hmm. it's it's getting there right now but it you know 20 years ago 6,000 years if we're going to say 10,000 plus obviously that would be scoffed at but now it's not looking so unreasonable when we say maybe 20,000 years old because um one of the latest finds that we had was inside a new section of uh, the Ravna tunnels uh, the Ravna three tunnels which was discovered in 2000 and 18. We had some speleothems, so some stalagmites and stalactites, 
and we uh, used uranium thorium radiometric dating. And we were able to determine a minimum age of 19,000 years. And that was uh, deposited above one of the drywalls stratigraphically. So that means that the drywall had to have been in place first before that stalagmite could have started forming 19,000 years ago. So that's a minimum age for the formation, well, not the formation of the tunnels, but the tunnel drywalls being put into place 19,000 years old. And this would be one of the more um, sort of reliable uh, methods of dating that we've used. The problem with using carbon-14 dating, which we have relied upon, is that it's open to being uh, disrupted by groundwater, bringing in fresh carbon-14 into the sample. So, and obviously the older ones get, the, the less reliable carbon-14 is. So some of those carbon-14 dates dates that we have. Um, they're interesting, but for me, the uh, uranium thorium dating that we completed earlier this year is something definitely to pay attention to. And we do have plans as well to use uh, thermoluminescence dating. And now this, when we do this, it will be absolutely fantastic uh, proof that we have for the age of these pyramids. And how this works is that we're actually able to determine when uh, a piece of material, an object, the surface of the Bosnian pyramid of the sun, for example, when it last saw sunlight. So when was it buried? Now, the limit on this age, uh, on this method, is about 5 million years old. We can use it for young geological material. Now, if we take the natural uh, explanation, it's just a hill, the age of the Visochitsa, if it's just a hill, would be anywhere between 24 and 5 million years old. So if we do thermoluminescence on the surface of the Bosnian Pyramid of the Sun, and it's older than the limit of that test, we don't really need to know how old the material is. If it exceeds the limit of uh, the mm -hmm. testing method, thermoluminescence, then we can say it's uh, a natural hill. However, anything younger than that, then we've got to look at it with some interest because if it's 30,000 years, 50,000 years, 100,000 years, even a million years, it's still interesting scientifically because as I say, uh, the geology in the region is, only, is somewhere between 24 and 5 million years old. So if we find a rock deposit that's significantly younger than that, then we have to actually re-examine the whole geological history of this region. Hmm. Yeah, so that will be really exciting to see how that goes. But so with the results that you have for now, you can say that at least the tunnels uh, with the drywalls were built no later than 18,000 years ago. Is that correct? I think it's it's 19,000 years uh, plus or minus 2,000 years. So we're looking at the end of the glacial maximum. So this was when uh, the ice sheets were actually retreating. Uh, and so we'd have re a slowly, but surely there'd be a, obviously climatic changes. There'd also be a lot more water. Uh, the oceans would be filling back up with that ice melting. So we would be seeing cultures migrating from areas where previously they didn't have access to because of the ice sheets. But as they're retreating, there's going to be a lot of migration across the European continent. So maybe that has something to do uh, with the tunnels being produced, although that's not my area of expertise. But uh, it is interesting to see that the age that we got does coincide with the end of the glacial maximum. Yeah. yeah. Good. And um, there is a question here that I haven't heard before. That is, uh, do you know more about what size the people had at the time they were building the pyramids? I haven't looked into that. Do any of you know anything about that? The size of the people. I think this comes from the fact that those tunnels are a lot of the tunnels, not all of them, because the, the tunnels do change in shape and size. But some of those tunnels are very small. And you have to actually get down on your knees to actually tra travel through them. Um, I think we have to understand that perhaps these tunnels weren't actually made as a communication route necessarily. They may have been. Some of them, I'll say some of, some of the tunnels are over three metres in height. But some of them are less than a metre. 
it might not all all of those tunnels might not have the same function. Some of them might not be made for people to be walking up and down. So I wouldn't use the the shape and size of the tunnels to um, to make any sort of conclusions as to the height of the people that built those tunnels. Because just as we can crawl on our hands and knees, so so could people back in those days. As well. However, maybe they were shorter than they are today. Who knows? Yeah. And um, Rie, I would like to, uh, you to tell a little bit, if you would like to do so, about um, this uh, subject of why the pyramids are being so questioned. And so, so why do so many people doubt it? We've been touching upon that already. And also, why haven't people heard about these pyramids when it's It seems to be the most massive pyramid in the world. You've written something about that in your book, so maybe you could say something about that. Yes, surely. Well, um, what I've come to realize with my uh, studies of the Bosnian pyramids is that um, in society, there is this tendency that people who are up in high power, highly estimated, they're the ones we listen to. And we ask fewer questions to their arguments than we do to people of lower status. And this has a very conservative impact on how we look at everything and how slowly things changed also within science. Um, so in, with the Bosnian pyramids, um, the European Association of Archaeologists have made a statement that was published after a short visit to the Bosnian pyramids. According to Philip Coppens, um, the, the head of the Bosnian, uh, uh, of the European Association of Archaeologists just took a taxi tour around to see the sites and that was all that was done. Um, so uh, it was a very brief survey. Uh, just, just look at it and not go into more detail or further Uh, scientific investigation um, but the European Association of Archaeologists made a statement stating that it's not pyramids it's a cruel hoax on humanity and it has no place within the field of genuine science um, and that Uh, statement has has really caught on and it's been shared and people listen to that regardless of the fact that it's not backed by science yeah. and um, I've tried the same thing actually personally I was on the radio here in Denmark being interviewed and I I was given half an hour interview where I went into all the details with the concrete and the tunnels and blah 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 and then afterwards They didn't tell me this, but after I left, they also asked a professor in archaeology. So, okay, is it true? We've just heard this half an hour from this girl talking about the Bosnian pyramids, but are there pyramids in Bosnia? And he just went, no, it's not true. There are no pyramids in Bosnia. Okay, thank you so much. And that was all. And the, the, the journalist had a lot of critical questions to me because I'm not a professor in archaeology. Um, but no critical questions towards that archaeologist. So I sent him an email afterwards asking, okay, so apparently you know it's not pyramids. Please, can you show me the evidence? Because I'd like to see it if you do have it. But he said, no, sorry, I don't have anything. I just heard it on a conference in Malta. And who shared the information there? It was, of course, the head of the European Association of Archaeologists. And it goes around like that. So that's something that I've really learned from this is we need to really pay attention to how much do we trust people just because of their title and also remember to ask critical questions with, when they share something. And this is, I don't say this to point fingers as at anyone in particular, but to show that we have a, a tendency that's, uh, that we need to be aware of because also these high profiles, of course, they get more attention on the media and, and people listen to them more. And that is a problem if you have something new that you want to come forward with. Yeah, I, mean, I, I remember when uh, National Geographic came to film a documentary uh, to debunk uh, 
the Bosnian pyramids. And they brought with them uh, two professors from British universities. Uh, one was a geologist and one was an archaeologist. Now, being an archae a geologist myself, I uh, was interested in the background of this uh, geology professor coming here. And he, uh, I asked him directly, have you been to Bosnia before? No, it was his first time to Bosnia. Have you uh, visited any other pyramids in the world before? No. So coming to Bosnia, first time, first time to look at pyramids. And his first uh, day, he arrived at the Ravna tunnels. And before he'd even taken out his compass clinometer, which is a fundamental piece of tool for a geologist, before he'd even taken any direct measurements, he was saying that it's all nonsense. And this is someone claiming to be the voice of reason in, in science, science and National Geographic uh, promoting his, which it is just an opinion at this point, because he hasn't taken any measurements. Um, and National Geographic are filming that opinion and presenting it to the general public as an absolute fact. Now, over the course of the week, that I think he was there for five days or a week, he did take a few different strikes um, of the north face of the Bosnian period of the sun, for example. But again, we're talking about such a vast area. It's 2.2 kilometres between each of the peaks. I mean, it's a massive, we're talking at least 24 square kilometres over the whole surface area of, of the Bosnian Pyramid Valley. You need to take more than a few dip and strike direct measurements to understand um, what's going on with the geology. Now, I'm sure he looked at the geological map of the region, which is available online, um, to make any conclusions. But what I, I've actually gained access to is the raw data collection or the geological map that's been promoted um, as proof that it's just geology. And when you're looking at this data collection, this is like the raw data what a geologist would be uh, doing in the field. I noticed that there are zero measurements made on the Bosnian Pyramid of the Sun, uh, Bosnian Pyramid of the Moon, Bosnian Pyramid of Dragon, Temple of Mother Earth, Pyramid of Love, the, the geologist creating the most recent geological map didn't make any measurements on those areas of contention. Now, is that deliberate or is it just the fact that there weren't any exposures at the time that geological map was made? Because obviously the, the Pyramid of the Sun Foundation has created these exposures. That doesn't really matter. What matters is that these geologists are using this geological map to make conclusions. And obviously archeologists are listening to what these geologists are saying, but they're basing their opinions on maps that don't actually have any direct measurements on the locations that we're debating, whether it's a pyramid or natural hill. So it's absurd, actually, it's completely absurd. And I, I would just like to have, to see more people come here with an open mind, you know, they call themselves scientists and they're standing for the truth and everything like that, but they're not actually. They're just listening to, as you say, someone in authority who says it's not a pyramid and they're taking their word for it and they're not looking any further. Now, obviously, there's other reasons why that is the case. I mean, people uh, in 2020, 2021, um, they lose their careers for just an innocent tweet, for example, these days. They say the wrong thing. Um, they could get canned. At universities in, in uh, Britain, for example, now professors, I'm sure, have to be very careful what they're saying because every lecture is recorded and filmed. Whereas, you know, 10, 20 years ago, that wasn't the case. They might have been able to say something controversial uh, to pique the interest of their students. Now it's probably a lot scarier for them to actually push the boundaries of what's acceptable free speech because it could just be recalled up and posted on the internet and taken out of context. So I think a lot of people in positions, not necessarily at the top of the food chain, but in the middle, who might have the expertise to base an opinion on fact, probably aren't daring to do so. We had um, an Egyptologist come in the early days uh, of the project, and he spent a great amount of time here studying the Bosnian pyramids. And he was making 
public statements supporting the project uh, and supporting the notion that there was anthropogenic activity shaping, at the minimum, shaping these hills into pyramids. And uh, when he returned back to Egypt, he was um, he lost his job for no other reason that he was uh, outspoken on the Bosnian Pyramid Project. We, we've had an archaeologist work here in the past who was threatened by her professors. If she supports the project, she'll never work as a professional archaeologist again. And bless her soul, two days after she received that letter, she was on uh, Bosnian television supporting the project. But unfortunately, uh, her professors did stick by their words. That was very sad as well. So a lot of people don't want to risk their careers at this point. Yeah. So I think what, what we can all learn from this is that every time we listen to new information, whether uh, talking for or against uh, discoveries, we always need to listen to the arguments rather than to who is saying what. And Uh, science to be true science always need to be open-minded and actually do uh, the investigations and not just base uh, things on hypotheses. Um, but we need to move forward also to to uh, get to around these uh, last few topics uh, and also take some questions. And I've seen some people are already writing questions. Uh, that's perfect. You can put them there in the chat already now and then we'll take them in the end. But uh, we have two more things that, that we will look at. And uh, one of them is, what are the latest discoveries here in, in Bosnia, Richard? What have you been finding uh, the last few years like of the ma major importance? Okay, so we touched on uh, the speleothems and the uh, radiometric dating. Um, that took place, that tunnel system that we found was the Ravna 3 tunnels. We first identified that in 2018. And this significantly extended the lateral, the known lateral extent of the Ravna tunnels complex by several hundred meters. And then a year later in 2019, we discovered another section of the tunnels, which we're calling the Ravna 4 tunnels. Uh, and that was found completely by accident. We were doing some landscaping in the park near to the tunnels, and we found uh, an entry point. And this is the most southerly uh, entrance that we found into the Ravna tunnels complex. So this brings us closer to the Bosnian pyramid of the sun than we've ever reached so far. Um, now, in, uh, in 2020, the plan was to focus our excavations on this new tunnel section, Ravna 4, uh, with the help of volunteers. Unfortunately, because of <clears throat> everything going on in the world, we weren't able to follow through with that. So right now, Ravna 4 tunnels is pretty much laying dormant and sits as it was found in 2019. So we're hoping in the summer of this year, we'll have some more volunteers and we'll be able to start excavating those tunnels. Because as I say, this brings us Uh, most southerly location and therefore closer to the Bosnian Pyramid of the Sun than we've ever been uh, within this subterranean network of tunnels. Great. Um, my last question for you is um, what do you think the purpose uh, or the purposes are of uh, the, the pyramids and the tunnels? And actually that collides with some of the questions that have been asked. So let us uh, start uh, on the questions, uh, starting with this uh, about what, uh, why were they built? And there's uh, a person asking uh, if you could um, elaborate on or share any ideas of uh, whether these uh, pyramids are grid points uh, of ley lines uh, positioned to hold physical energy. So is that one of the reasons, uh, and could there be other reasons? So there are probably multiple functions for pyramids, and not every pyramid is the same either. So the function of uh, pyramids in Egypt, for example, may be different to the function of some of the pyramids in, say, Mexico or in uh, Brazil, for example. Now, some of them can be just built for ritualistic purposes, Um, or and other thing, 
things that they could be used for is actually they were rather than being tombs. I mean, hopefully everyone logged into this um, webinar right now is at a point where we can dismiss the notion that the original purpose of these pyramids were built for megalomania pharaohs to be buried in. Okay, that is not what the pyramids were built for, especially the Bosnian pyramids. Um, just the sheer scale of them. Now these these structures are certainly should be looked at more in terms of machinery or technology. Now how this technology works, you know, I would, that's why we're here. We're trying to understand it. Um, anyone who says they understand exactly how a pyramid works is probably being a little bit disingenuous. But what we can assume is that these uh, machines, at least partially, run on the passive electromagnetic fields present um, on and in the Earth, as well as also astronomical uh, energetics that are coming down. I mean, in, in Giza, for example, uh, the Scan Pyramids project uh, measured that the, the chambers inside there are collecting um, solar particles and concentrating this energy in certain points within the pyramid. Um, is it by chance? Probably not. It's probably engineered that way. Uh, and so one of the functions is, is how, when people are talking about grids, uh, why are they building pyramids where they're building them? Certain points on the Earth will have certain electromagnetic hotspots, let's, let's just say nodes and antinodes, where there's focal points for, for example, telluric currents traveling through the Earth's crust. And it all depends on the material underneath the ground, as well as the location uh, geometrically, because some rocks, for example, can conduct uh, better than other rocks. That's why, generally speaking, you might find pyramids built um, within sedimentary basins rather than um, igneous fields, for example, because there's uh, in the sedimentary fields, water is able to move, percolate through that rock. And obviously motion of water also creates an elect electrical current. So it might be a coincidence, or it probably isn't, but um, underneath the Bosnian pyramids, for example, we've got some really fantastically thick layers of clay, really pure clay. And this clay is non-expanding clay. So what that means is whether the, the clay is saturated with water or it's dehydrated, the volume stays the same. So not all clay is like that. So some clay, if it gets wet, it will expand and then it will contract when it dries out. So you imagine trying to build a structure that you want to last through uh, a long period of time on material that's come changing its volume, that's going to create uh, an unstable foundation. Whereas here in uh, in Visico, that clay is non-expanding. So depending on the, uh, well, ignoring the environmental changes that occur through time, that clay will stay the same volume. Obviously, clay, when it's saturated with water, is extremely conductive. In fact, it's one of the most conductive geological materials on the earth is a saturated clay. So if you wanted to build a pyramid structure that relies on the electrical currents traveling through the world, you might want to build it on top of the kind of clay that we are finding here in Visico. So going back to the function of the pyramid, I'm not going to go too much into my sort of theories as to exactly what it's the functions of the, the pyramids are, but certainly we can look at it as a machine that utilizes naturally occurring earth currents to function. Yes. And maybe I can add that in the tunnels, there are megaliths that are placed exactly on top of where the underground currents of water are crossing. So we have something there uh, that these megaliths are exactly on top of that. So intentionally placed, whether it's the megalith placed there or it's maybe holding the water in place somehow. Um, and with in terms of ley lines, um, we have been looking at ley lines and dowsing. And of course, that's not strictly scientific, but that's a thing I also love about this project, that it's open to, okay, let's like let everybody loose and let, let them have their own go with their own methods and see what happens and let's inspire each other. Maybe something will come up. So we've been doing some dowsing as well and seeing that 
uh, ley lines do cross there. And Marianne Lene, a, a well-renowned Danish uh, shaman has been there and she could also feel how the, the lines of energy are centered within the pyramid of the sun and, and meeting there. Um, so yes, it's definitely uh, got something to do with the energy grids. Yes, and uh, with these megaliths and the other um, uh, things, things that are going on in the tunnels with the very fresh air, lots of negative ions, uh, the tunnels have very beneficial properties for healing the human body. So uh, whether they were built to do that or if it's just a very lucky uh, side effect of the tunnels, um, that's also a function, at least nowadays, of, of the tunnels. Um, we have some more questions here. Let's take them. This one here asking, have you yet found an entrance into the Sun Pyramid or any of the other pyramids? So the only entrances that we have um, into the underground tunnel network are two and a half, three kilometers away from the Bosnian Pyramid of the Sun presently. So to answer that question succinctly, no. However, there used to be a hole in the top of the Pyramid of the Sun, according to local people. Um, but that closed, that hole was closed uh, in recent history. So they say there used to be a hole, but it's not something that we can reopen and check for a fact now because of this uh, zone at the top where we're not allowed to do any digging because of the remnants of the medieval castle. Yeah. Yeah, the top two thirds of the pyramid have uh, restricted access to any excavations but from the Bosnian Pyramid of the Sun. And apparently, according to those sort of um, reports of where those entrances are, they all exist within that restricted zone. Actually, we are working right now to have that uh, zone reduced significantly so that we can perhaps start excavating more in those areas. And again, we're still very far away from the medieval fort at the top. Uh, and we have no intention of excavating there or damaging what has already been destroyed by the reconstructive work. Um, so hopefully we will get that restriction lifted soon. Yes. And um, I guess uh, the person who was asking this question were comparing to the Egyptian pyramids that uh, seem to be intentionally built to, for people to go into them since there are higher glyphs and such inside. But uh, for now, we don't know for sure what's inside these pyramids, whether they were actually made uh, to, uh, so with the purpose of people entering into them or whether people were not supposed to do that. But there has been scannings uh, to, to scan for the temperature of uh, of the hills or mountains or pyramids. And it seems in on these scannings that uh, there are empty uh, rooms inside because um, the temperatures are higher. Isn't that so, Rich? Yeah, so they, they call it thermal inertia. Uh, they measure the temperatures at the beginning of the day and at the end of the day, and you can measure the rate of heat loss, for example. And if you've got empty cavities inside the hill, it's going to heat up quicker and cool down faster. Uh, and that's what we see on all of the pyramid locations is that it has a, a, a high thermal inertia compared to the natural hills in the, mm -hmm. in the area. So yeah, probably there will be some uh, open spaces uh, just like in the Giza pyramids, but also it took a long time and a lot of effort to gain entry into uh, the the Great Pyramid of Giza, and that was with it out being buried uh, with soil and trees and everything else on top of it. So uh, I think patience is is required, um, and the, the geophysical techniques that we have available to us. You know, people say, oh, "Why don't you just use georadar or seismic, seismic surveys?" Um, it's difficult because of the material we're facing. There's a lot of clay in this area. Geo radar doesn't work very well at all with clay. You get a lot of reflections back. And with seismic surveys, you've got to remember that the, the, the scale of what we're looking at. A lot of these surveys won't be able to produce a resolution high enough to be able to find a small passageway entrance. So unfortunately, 
Um, there is no magic um, bullet that we can use, not one specific method to find where these tunnels are. Um, it's going to take a lot of time and patience to actually identify where these uh, entrances into the tunnel exist, entrances mm. into the pyramid exist. Mm. Yeah, and also uh, when you get to see where these uh, tunnels entrances are on the pyramid, we have to remember the pyramid is so huge that on the bottom of it, we have houses uh, a long way up and until it starts to be a forest. So uh, if you have entrances coming out in the backyard of uh, someone's garden or <laughs> into somebody's house, you cannot just dig there. So it has to be uh, entrances that are at places where it's possible to get the permission to excavate. And also, um, a lot of the uh, municipal water for Visico is being extracted from underneath the base of the pyramid as well. So any passages, um, any excavations, it potentially, hypothetically, could disrupt um, the water supply for the entire city. So this is some uh, logistical issues that will have to be carefully Uh, examined when entering into a pyramid. If the water table has raised to a point where the passages are themselves flooded by the water supply that the town is using. That's a good reason, reason to be patient with the excavations, that the slower it goes, the less risk of damage, both to uh, the water and also to all the old uh, uh, artifacts and sites. Um, we have uh, one more question here that says, is it the same or two different cultures who have constructed the Bosnian and the Egyptian pyramids? What are your personal opinions? Hmm. So, I mean, if we look at um, pyramids all around the world, they all have their unique style. Okay, so when we're talking about, probably they are different cultures that have a, a single sort of binding civilization. So there may have been a global civilization just like there is today. But uh, for example, uh, the architecture in South America today isn't the same as the architecture in Europe today with our cultures. So you could argue it's a similar kind of thing when you have pyramid builders in Egypt, pyramid builders in Bosnia, pyramid builders in China, for example. They will be based on certain design principles and they may have communication between each other, but also they will have their own style, their own background, their own languages. And so probably we're looking at something like that. It's a global community, but also with individual cultures within that. Mm. And uh, regarding the timeline of it, um, For now, the pyramids in Bosnia uh, seem to be older than the Egyptian pyramids, but who knows, uh, maybe the Egyptian pyramids will at some point be proven to be also uh, somewhat older than what yeah. is uh, mainstream mean, uh, be beliefs it's, now. It's difficult to base the age of uh, our pyramids compared to Egyptian pyramids because, again, the ages are always changing and we don't have all the facts from the Uh, Giza pyramids to know exactly how old they are. There's some ideas, but again, more and more information comes to a head and we, we change that age again. But one one thing we can look at, for example, is if we look at uh, the Egyptian pyramid building culture, we see that the Great Pyramids are the best quality and they're the oldest. And then as we move closer to present day time, the quality of those pyramid constructions become less and less. And you look at some of the most recent pyramids built in Egypt and they're just piles of rubble on the floor, whereas the oldest pyramids are still almost in pristine condition minus the covering stones that were removed. So looking at that trend, we see in Bosnia, those pyramids are even bigger, for example. So it may be that it's an even higher technology. So if we're going backwards in time where things are getting better, the older they are, then we use that trend to just look at it and say, well, the Bosnian pyramids therefore should be older than the Egyptian pyramids if they're even bigger, for example, following that trend that we see 
within the pyramids within the Egyptian culture. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. That was the, the questions that we have uh, received for now. Um, but to round this uh, webinar off, um, I think it would be good to mention if people who here who have seen uh, and heard what we have said would like to know more and get involved or uh, go and see the pyramids in the, in real life or or see some more uh, pictures or videos of it. Um, where can you go for more information and how can you get uh, get your fingers in the actual? Yes, yeah, so we story? we have um, Bosnian. Uh, Pyramid of the Sun website, just uh, Google Pyramid of Sunsa or Pyramid of Sunsa .ba is the web address. That's in Bosnian and also it's in English. It's translated into several different languages. Uh, also, we have um, one of the, the official Facebook pages is uh, Dr. Sam Osmanagic. All the information gets published there on uh, Dr. Sam's Facebook page. Also, I have a Facebook page, uh, Richard Hoyle. Um, my YouTube channel, Forgotten Pyramids, that's where this will be getting uploaded. Um, <clears throat> and regarding the, uh, the volunteering camp, I have to say this is, uh, all three of us started this project as volunteers, so we're a little bit biased. But if you really want to understand and um, you know, learn more about the pyramids, there is no better way of doing it than to become a volunteer. And I know the world is a little bit crazy still right now, and we don't really know what is going to happen. But as it stands right now, we are operating on the assumption that a volunteer camp will be going forward in summer of 2021. Um, in fact, the restrictions here in Bosnia aren't as stringent as uh, some of the other countries in Europe. You can, mm -hmm. And there are still people, travel, international people traveling here into the country and they just require a, a negative test result from the last um, 48 hours and there's no uh, restriction of movement once you have that negative test result. Hopefully in the summer when that comes we won't need any of that nonsense anymore but uh, for more information on the volunteering camp um, just head to pyramidofsunsa.ba, follow the links and all the information will be there. Great. Uh, and um, yeah, Ri just posted some links in the, the chat, which we can also post uh, alongside uh, the, the replay video. And uh, Ri, if uh, people would like to uh, read your book, how can they find that? Um, my book can be purchased from my own website, riejesperson.dk, or from the um, publisher, lemuelbooks.dk. And I've shared a link in the chat as well to where you can buy it. And if you should be interested in coming with Julie and I on a portal journey and meet Richard and see the pyramids and feel the energy yourself, you're also very welcome to do that. And you can find more information about that on portaljourneys.dk. Um, and we're also on Facebook, Portal Journeys, and the links are in the chat. Yes. And uh, for now, we have uh, waiting lists for our trips because our two trips in uh, 2020 were postponed. Uh, but as soon as um, it's being opened up again for, for travel, uh, we will arrange more trips. So you can, you can sign yourself up and get the information uh, on Portal Journeys DK uh, on uh, when we have uh, uh, more seats available for our trips to Bosnia. And um, there is just one quick little question. Let, let's take that uh, last one while people also are, are giving some uh, nice uh, messages here. Uh, one is writing, can I build a small pyramid in my garden and benefit from the energy in it? Do you recommend a website or somewhere I can find information about a homemade pyramid? Absolutely. In, in, in England, I actually met his wife thought he'd gone crazy he actually turned his whole back garden into a pyramid and he, he's a builder and uh, he aligned it north south east west I mean it looks ridiculous in in the area because there's this big white pyramid in his back garden but he swore by it that he would go inside there in the evenings and meditate sometimes he would sleep in there 
and it really helped him and he found it to be very beneficial. So yeah, the pyramid shape, um, absolutely. You, you can actually buy um, copper pyramids that you put over your bed, for example, that you can sleep in. Because the most important thing is the pyramid shape. Uh, the shape of the pyramid does focus um, different kinds of energetics just by having that geometric shape. Even a picture of it can do such things. That's how symbology works, for example, um, or one of the ways it works. Um, but yeah, just get a compass and um, build it north, south, east, west, and you'll have a fantastic time. Why not? Great. Yeah, so thank you, uh, Richard. Thank you, Ri. Uh, and thank you, all of you who have uh, joined us here tonight. And um, thanks for your comments and your questions. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. And um, we look forward to to seeing you out there in real life once it's possible to do so again. We look forward to going to Bosnia as soon as possible also. Yeah, so I look forward to everyone coming as well because it's been a strange year. Um, we actually, just, just to go off on a tangent quick, we actually had one of our busiest years this year, strangely enough. And, you know, one of the benefits of this um, whole fiasco is that in former Yugoslavian countries, they're taking more interest now in the Bosnian pyramids than ever before. So that's one of the benefits, because it's always been sad that they've kind of ignored this fantastic phenomena in their own country, for example. And now they're actually interested uh, because they've been stuck in, in, in Bosnia and the surrounding countries. They've come here and they've seen what all of us crazy pyramid people have been uh, talking about for the last 10 years. But yeah, it'll be really good when uh, everyone can come back and uh, enjoy the location, the ancient archaeology, the energy and everything else. So I look forward. And uh, thank you very much for having me on this evening, Julian Reed. This is my first Zoom webinar. <laughs> it's it's really, you know, yeah, I feel like I've got to get involved with it now that it's the new normal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yes, I also want to say thank you. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Julie. And thank you, all you lovely participants for all your supportive comments and your good questions. And um, see you out there. Okay. Ciao. Yeah. Ciao. Bye-bye.